This video is about creating engaging activities for a remote class. And I'm going to talk about four specific kinds of remote learning prompts, things we can do in class. Some of these things can be done actually live, and you can also use them in asynchronous ways between classes as assignments or exercises. So the first thing I want to talk about is curation. And this is something we can ask students to do in a variety of different kinds of ways. And I want to give you a specific example of curation for a reporting class. You can tell students that for the next activity, you'd like them to spend a few minutes curating and annotating reports about the impact of the virus, the pandemic, on businesses and cultural organizations in New York City. Dropping them into distinct categories by style of coverage, uh, by intended audience, by length, by medium or format, or by level of detail or specificity. So the students are finding these pieces and then they are categorizing them. They're curating them, creating a set of uh, quality stories in various different topics. You could assign them publications to start with. You could give them a suggested list of publications to explore. You could assign them based on their beats or personal interests. And this could be something they could do over a couple of days. It could be something they do live as a kind of intense, quick exercise, um, sort of a breaking news curation exercise. There's a variety of different ways to do it, but it gets everyone involved. It's kind of fun to do, and it's something that's lively and active and teaches them to kind of practice their news judgment. The next kind of learning prompt is a create learning prompt. And I want to give an example in this case for a health and science type class. Um, students could be asked to create a Google Doc or a Google Slide Deck or any other kind of document that will serve as an explainer about how the CDC works. And uh, it'll include original reporting from exp excerpts, experts. <laughs> um, they can do web research, they can send emails, they can make calls, um, they can reference links and materials that you provide if you want to give them some starter material. Um, they can in then include the material they gather in, in their doc uh, or their slide deck. And again, this could be something they do as part of a, a live class session um, with your guidance and you're kind of there to help them along. Or it could be something they do as an exercise in between classes, um, maybe instead of some of the live, long live time, if you find that useful. The next uh, uh, area is critique. And um, here's an example for, uh, for an international kind of reporting context. The students could be asked to pick three in-depth pieces addressing how a particular international leader has been handling the pandemic. And to develop their critique, the students can assess uh, a specific piece of journalistic work um, one at a time. Uh, it's creator's objectives, the context, the constraints they faced. Um, maybe the student could comment on what they actually did in neutral terms in terms of the reporter what they included or didn't include, what worked well toward their objective, um, and uh, what could have been done more effectively, what questions um, the student had about the piece as the student was reading the piece or watching the piece or listening to the piece. So there's a variety of different ways of kind of encouraging students to develop their, their critical skills by doing a kind of live active critique like this. And then finally, uh, students can collaborate in a variety of different ways on any of the kinds of activities that are related to curation or creation or critiquing that, um, that were referenced a minute ago. And to, to, to do these kinds of activities, we can explore new platforms or, or experiment with new platforms. They can curate something onto Pinterest board, for example. Um, photography uh, works well that way, but other kinds of articles can also be curated onto a Pinterest or a Trello board. In terms of creating, they can create a Google slide deck collaboratively or individually. They can work together on a Miro canvas, which is a kind of a digital whiteboard, or it could just be a Google Doc or any other kind of document. The tool isn't super important, but it's nice to, be, to experiment and find one that works really well for you, for your purposes. Collaboration can be really helpful. Again, this can be on a, a shared Google Doc, and then critiquing can be done annotating a PDF um, using something like Document Cloud or, or to annotate a site, you can use something like Hypothesis. There are a lot of tools like that. Or to keep it simple, again, they can put their comments and annotations in a Google Doc uh, or a Google Slide Deck if you want to keep it really simple. These kinds of activities, I think, should be aligned along the way of the course, um, fit into the things you're doing, the objectives, getting them ready for their next assignment or the next thing you're going to do in class. The activity should be broken up into little pieces, so it's clear, first do this, first create your Google Doc, put your name on it, put the sources you're going to use, then start reading, spend the next 10 minutes reading the first item. So give them very clear instructions, break that up into pieces so they know what to do, what's expected of them, how to proceed. 
um, make the instructions really clear, make it clear in their mind why they're doing it, how to do it. Um, it should be something that's doable for them at their skill level. Um, if they're first semester, maybe they're not ready to do the same things the third semester students are able to do independently. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, I think that should be enjoyable. So I like giving people flexibility and, and freedom to do th things in a way that's fun for them or interesting and engaging um, based on topics that they're already interested in and in a way that's a little bit fun and creative. I think in general, these kinds of activities ideally can be broken down into 20 minute blocks. That doesn't mean the whole thing can be done in 20 minutes. I just like to think about giving them a, a set of activities that they can do in the first 20 minutes, then the next 20 minutes, just so that they have a clear sense of where this is heading and how it breaks up. I think it's fun if it's something bold and challenging, um, something kind of exciting for them to work on. The instructions should be really crisp and clear and short so that they understand what they have to do and it's written down. I really believe in designing things for um, remote sessions. The visuals are what people are looking at on their screen. So it's really helpful to have really strong visuals. As a teacher in these sessions, we need to be really energetic. We need to bring 120% of our energy because they're only seeing us in a little rectangle on a screen. And we wanna push forward whatever our teaching is about um, with these kinds of activities. I want to just reiterate that we should be really clear about what we're doing, explaining that to students, exactly how we're doing it, what are the three steps we're going to do, how long are we going to spend on it, and then why are we doing it. Sometimes we just jump into an activity and people are not totally clear on why we're doing something or how to do it. These kinds of engaging activities can be part of a broad class session that's effective, that begins with something exciting at the launch that ends with a strong conclusion and that develops um, their thinking or understanding of the topic as the class session progresses. And if we do these kinds of things, if we create these engaging activities, we can really build a really exciting, lively, remote class session.